Hi, good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Rudy Malik and I'm the Head of Brand and Communications at Cisco Biosecurity. Cisco Biosecurity Sinembra Heart is a newly established division of Cisco Security, uh, Cisco M. Uh, the, the biosecurity division formalizes the ambition of the company to focus resources and apply its experiences in managing biohazard crisis. Uh, Cisco Biosecurity provides business continuity, management consultation, both broad and specific, as well as sanitization services and products. Today, we are presenting the second of our webinar series, The Controlled Norm. This is a reflection of what is happening in the world right now with an unseen enemy we have come to know as COVID-19. COVID sorry, The spread of COVID-19 is changing how we live and work in ways we would not have thought possible a few months ago. Many businesses spent the first several weeks of the crisis reviewing business continuity plans, establishing crisis command centers, and ensuring the safety and security of their workers. With the announcement of the CMCO, which started on the 4th of May, extending to June 9th, we thus would expect these businesses to be rushing to be in compliance and learning to operate in the controlled normal, yet are continuing to respond to immediate issues. Businesses will be focusing on implementing tactical steps to preserve business value, operational scenario planning, even financial analysis relating to liquidity and an assessment of the various government assistance programs. Today, with the controlled norm scope, we will talk about how we can use uh, data-driven insights to manage COVID-19 infection risk. We have with us today a CEO from a consumer intelligence company who will be able to give some insights on what data can actually do and what are some of its limitations. Just a little housekeeping before we get started, especially to our audiences on Facebook and YouTube. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the comment section of, uh, on YouTube or Facebook. I'll either bring them up during the presentation or we will try to get them answered at the end. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest today. He's none other than Ashran Datuk Ghazi. Ashran, good morning. Hey, Rudy. Morning. Yes. So Ashran is the CEO of uh, Datel, a consumer intelligence company that aspires to be the global central point of reference for ASEAN consumer data by disrupting the way data is collected, structured, analyzed, and delivered to clients. It currently has presence in Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, and Malaysia, with near plans to expand to Myanmar and Vietnam. Recently, Datel created the Citizen Personal Index, uh, or in shorter form, CPI. The app generally collects data from users and then generates a CPI score that indicates if a user is of low or high risk of COVID-19 infection. This is supported by an enterprise version which employers have a view of. Generally, the app's objective is to manage risk of infection either in the workplace or for <clears> self use <throat> So, um, Ashran, welcome. Welcome to the show. Glad to have you here. Hoping oh, to hear happy. some insight from you in a bit, you know. Uh, thanks for being here with us today. I know it's very close to the Raya holidays, but uh, we wanted to discuss this topic, uh, which hopefully will give some insights to people who are actually been in the offices for a while, and some of them are not right. in offices yet, you know. So um, maybe we'll just straight away go into the to the questions, right? Sure. So sure. as a as a consumer intelligence firm, what changes has Datel observed in the last thirty days? Um, well, interesting. Um, uh, one, one, one thing that, that I think pe what people may not realize um, is that while um, a lot of conversation around COVID and how to handle with this whole pandemic right now uh, talks about how businesses need to go digital. And I think that's been um, quite a recurring theme uh, in many, many conversations, many, many webinars out there, right? Yes. Um, but I, I think uh, while this is, you know, factually correct, uh, and the data shows that also, um, but um, what the data shows also is that there's still about 75% uh, of uh, the population um, that is uh, still entirely shopping purely offline, right? Um, and, and the shift in this current period itself is not as uh, huge um, between those that's doing offline and moving into the digital uh, space um, while, while it is growing. So on one lens, it's an opportunity uh, as what people are saying right now. Um, but at the same time, I think businesses have got to also think, right? 
how do they uh, address this larger segment of the population? Um, I think a lot of people are talking from how the transactional volume has increased, um, but that is still coming largely from um, uh, the existing um, uh, digital uh, users themselves. Uh, the question to everyone is pretty much, uh, how do we get the rest uh, to transition uh, into this process as, as easily as possible? I see. Um, and in terms of data, I mean, we see like, a lot of consumer intelligence, but how feasible is it to access valid data in Malaysia and how can we make it better? Um, well, uh, number one, uh, of course, it depends on what kind of data it is, right? Um, and and uh, one of the reasons um, we embarked on this uh, consumer intelligence front uh, is uh, to some extent really answering that question <laughs> because we do not think it is feasible to get uh, good access uh, to good data. Uh, you can get data out there, you know, and what most people would do. Um, uh, you've got two extremes, right? You've got the free supposed data that accessible to people uh, when you do Google search. Um, and then uh, the next uh, uh, price point is what market research companies probably do, and that price point starts bumping up already. Um, uh, so, so when we talk about, you know, if you want good, it gets really expensive. Um, but if you want it uh, uh, affordable, then uh, it's not necessarily as good. Um, and and when we embarked on on, on this this uh, consumer intelligence journey, is to kind of look in terms of making it accessible. And I keep telling my team and other members, uh, accessibility here actually refers to two lenses, right? Uh, one, it is available, right? And and two, uh, it is affordable. Available and not affordable is not accessible. <laughs> <laughs> but in the end, like you mentioned, <clears throat> um, data at the end, premium data is chargeable at the end of the day. It's, 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 no, it's uh, not correct. free. Correct, correct. But um, another question I would like to ask is uh, the kind of infrastructures that need to be in place. What kind of fundamental infrastructures need to be in place to enhance uh, data generation and its connectivity and the consistency of this data generation? Um, well, uh, when, when you're talking about... Um, if you frame this from a digital lens, right? Because uh, that's the easiest form of uh, capturing data right now. Um, the, the short answer would be having uh, at least uh, really cheap bandwidth, number one. Um, and, and like you said, uh, uh, that, that connectivity element uh, needs to be, to be there. Um, uh, and then uh, it goes beyond your typical infrastructure. <laughs> uh, if you ask me, uh, after that, it goes in terms of mindsets. It goes in terms of um, clarity of how you manage data itself. Because uh, if you aren't able to address uh, this too, um, uh, it's not about uh, just getting a lot of data. It's about uh, also knowing uh, the possibilities of what you want to do with those data. Um, uh, everyone talks about data right now as if it's uh, a little magic thing. Uh, and, and people tend to go on a hoard mentality, right? I'm just going to gather every single thing, kind of put it aside, and then try to figure things out. But you've got to start with some level of clarity in terms of, what do you want to use that for? What is the outcome that you want to be able to push out um, uh, uh, with regards to that? Naturally, there are some things that you're not sure in terms yeah. of what you need to capture, right? Uh, I don't deny that more data uh, naturally is good, but um, uh, especially when data is coming from other parties uh, in the context of what we're doing, essentially, um, we can't just ask from the user, give me every single thing you have. Right. We've right. got to be clear in terms of what we want, and we've got to tell them what we're using this for, 
um, and, and what's the outcome that we're going to be dealing with this. So then the comfort level of parting with that data is there. Yeah, I know that so, one, of, one of the later questions I'm going to ask you is something to do with privacy. So Okay, okay. Yeah. Now, now, you mentioned this now, um, um, you have a lot of data and you have to have some sort of clarity in this, uh, yeah. on how, how the data is being used. And uh, we realized that um, your organization has decided to actually dive into risk management for businesses <laughs> during the time now, right? So yeah, do you see yeah. risk management to be something of uh, a kind of business that we'll be looking at for a duration of time, that business would be actually having to deal with this, deal with this possibly until the end of this year or even next year? Um, it requires uh, a little bit of education. I think uh, risk management to medium upper companies, uh, medium to larger companies, um, is, is probably something that is in their minds. Uh, but uh, medium lower companies, uh, not necessarily. Um, and I guess it's to some extent natural um, by, by virtue of uh, the levels of the companies uh, uh, itself. Um, so hence, it requires a little bit more education. <clears throat> but, um, and, and, and yes, like you said, uh, you know, we, we went into the context of risk management um, simply because when we were looking at things, um, risk management talks about, you know, preventive essentially, right? Yes. Um, uh, and, and while everyone was, uh, talking about, um, contact tracing. Yeah. Uh, which is a good thing. Uh, not that it's a bad thing, but, uh, what people have got to realize, uh, if I may say, Rudy, um, is that contact tracing actually comes into play when something happens. Yeah. So it's reactive. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's, it's, uh, but what is really interesting, right? If you look from a people's psychology, um, without anything else, that's better. Uh, people feel that with contact tracing or QR code check-ins, you mm -hmm. are, uh, are creating um, a safer environment. Is it really? <laughs> um, no. So, 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 and, and that's what it is, right? You know, everyone, hey, come, uh, register. It, 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 it has that psychological effect. I mean, if you, you, you look at offices and stuff, right? Oh, we've got to make sure that we um, uh, uh, check in. We've got to make sure that, you know, that uh, the social distancing is there. It all comes part and parcel of that. Yeah. So it's really more reactive and knowing, okay, if anything happens, there's something to fall back on and like, okay, this is what happened. Let's correct. Deep, deep, deep dive into that and see what actually yeah. it is to do. Yeah, so, so, um, uh, so not many people uh, naturally think from the lens that uh, we're embarking on, if you ask me, unless uh, me. So it, it requires a little bit of an education to tell people, say, no, that's good. Um, but, you know, once you know what something happens in, in your outlet or in your office, you probably got to shut it down. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, for at least two weeks to make sure that, you know, yes, you got to do in all the sanitization works, yeah. right? But there's going to be that cooling period that needs to be in it because your staff uh, uh, would need to be quarantined. True, 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 true. Um, so, so there's that slight education, although it's, 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 it's quite easy for people to understand. Um, but with the noise that's happening out there, uh, um, it's, it's, it's sometimes uh, not as easily heard. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wanted to ask you, um, especially for organizations, uh, how has the buy-in in uh, buy-in been for organizations in terms of using data that to manage this kind of risk during this uh, pandemic? Is it <clears throat> a new mentality that has, to, that has to be adapted, or is it driven by budgets? Um, it's probably a mix. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's either or. Budgets under current times is definitely uh, a, a constraint. Um, um, but the mentality, to some extent, uh, is definitely a case also, like I mentioned just now. Yeah. Um, but uh, just like most things, right? Um, when we're talking about this, it's, it's not really so much about telling them to use data to manage risk, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. um, 
because that takes into a longer conversation lah, to some extent. Uh, and, and that's how you described, uh, so the approach that we took essentially, and that's how you described uh, the CPI tool uh, or the citizen personal index that we created um, was actually to simplify that process. So, yeah. so I, I'm not telling them that, oh, you know, we're, uh, if they ask, then we can drill down. Mm -hmm. All we're telling them is, look, you've got now this uh, a score that you can actually, any. so yes, it is using data, you know, it has the whole of data components that's actually being uh, done to be able to get to that particular score itself. Um, but those are the nitty gritties. Um, people just want to know what is that value that I get uh, uh, out of this, right? Um, uh, similarly with, with um, uh, uh, contact tracing, um, so it is, I mean, when we talk about the data space itself, uh, people resonate more on the applied side uh, as opposed to literally talking about data itself, um, I, I per se. So normally it just comes parts and pass, uh, as a part and parcel of whatever that's been delivered. Um, and the minute you get that, that hurdle through, uh, that address the mentality a bit. Um, and then, then you got to hit on the budget point uh, to see whether um, uh, it resonates with that person uh, uh, or not. Yeah. Okay. Thank uh, you. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Makes sense. Now we come to the issue of uh, privacy. <laughs> How do because you have so much data, uh, and data comes from people, uh, and people nowadays are very much well aware of. Um, I guess privacy laws and whatnot. Uh -huh. So, yeah. how do we manage privacy issues when collecting such data from consumers? Is this a double-edged sword? Um, so, so before I ask what you mean by a double-edged sword, mm -hmm. um, what's this? Uh, managing uh, privacy issues uh, comes also from two lens. <laughs> I'm sorry to always highlight two lens, but. Being in this data space, um, there are just many perspectives uh, when, when people are dealing with it. Um, uh, so number one, uh, it's really about uh, providing value to the person that's giving data. Yeah. Um, if you can address the value proposition clearly enough, um, and if it resonates with that person, then uh, it becomes almost a non-issue. Step one, lah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And and uh, if I give a more general example that we're all probably accustomed to, is that uh, we all uh, enable our GPS and locations when we want to use Google Maps. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and we allow Google to store it. We allow Google to kind of track that for us because we think that the value proposition that we get. Uh, is worth that trade, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so that's what I mean. Essentially, if the value proposition is strong enough uh, for the consumers uh, or the person parting with that data, then um, it almost becomes um, a, a non-issue, so to speak. Um, yeah, so that actually answers my question because what I meant by double-edged sword is. Uh, this data is very valuable to you as well yeah. as uh, if we don't, but if we don't take care of the privacy issues and we don't address it, it could also be very disastrous for Correct. the organization. Correct. So Correct. I think you answered that you, there's a step process and there's value propositions for it and people understand what, what their data is being used for. So Correct. Correct. yes. Correct. Um, but if I can extend that a little bit more, yes. Rudy. Go ahead. Um, uh, so that's one part, right? And And that's just, for you to get that clarity with with the, the larger masses, yeah. yeah? Um, <clears throat> um, but the other reality that people need to understand is that um, uh, people talk about PDPA quite a bit. Yes. Right. And I, I get that question as 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 early as the start of conversation. Also, sometimes when we talk about all these things, um, but. Uh, I, I do think that people do not entirely appreciate the totality of PDPA and what needs to be done. Um, so, so uh, for, for us, you know, for, for those of you guys out there that uh, uh, have kind of 
uh, taken a deeper look at things. Um, PDPA has got the seven key principles that you ought to be comply, uh, complying with if you want to say that you are PDPA compliant. Um, and and uh, it depends on the nature of degree, right? So if you're just a retail outlet and doing it, it's not as uh, um, dangerous, so to speak. Um, but uh, if you're in the line of business that what we're doing, um, that's bread and butter. Yeah. Right. Um, it's it's not just about a hundred percent PDPA compliance. Um, you can't afford to go ninety nine point nine percent even. Um, so so in delivering such a service, um, some people think, hey, I can possibly do that too, um, from a technicality front. Um, and I tell people that the reason why we do this is because we are historically a data company. Yeah. Uh, and, and doing the business over the years, this is what we've always been taken care of. And doing this as an extension, um, it, it's just continuing the processes that we have in place. Um, because it's not just about your technical infrastructure, it's about your governance process, because data moves within the, the organization also. Yes. Right? So those are little, little things that sometimes people don't take into account. And, and, and when we tell people that, that um, you know, we're, we're the right company to deliver this and why we're doing this uh, across, is because we have been dealing with this. It is our bread and butter, and we can't afford for this to not be handled well enough. Yes. Um, so it's not just about technology, right? Technology Probably only addresses yeah. one part of it. Right? Yeah. It is important, but it only addresses one part of it. Um, but there are other parts that needs to be taken care of, essentially. Thank you, Ashran. Now, I want to show you a, 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 a slide. Let me, let me put it on the screen. So this shows, uh, this was actually done by McKinsey. Uh, and right. It shows consumer optimism. Uh, right. Like the, like the stage of COVID progression. And they look at a few countries here, China, India, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, Malaysia is not available. Like we, uh, we don't see that. But um, based on I can on actually this, provide you the Malaysian one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, then we can put it in. You know, um, and if you look here, you see um, the blue, blue bars here. It means those countries are optimistic that the, econo the economy will rebound within two to three months and grow as strongly or stronger than before. Right. Uh, we see... We see we don't see Japan giving a high optimistic count there. But right. Indonesia, India, and China, these are really highly populated countries, and they are feeling very optimistic about this. Right. Now, I have a question here. Now, you have a presence in Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, and Indonesia. Do you see yeah. businesses outside of Malaysia embracing this data to manage the business and showing this kind of optimism that it's going to be hey, over the next six to 12 months, it's going to be great. Because some of the countries here are showing that, oh, no problem. It's more than 50%, we'll, we'll be fine. So you, you have a presence in, this, in some of these countries. And right. uh, I want to ask you, how different are they from Malaysia? Are they, what, what are they doing differently? How do they feel this, this optimism? And this survey was actually done like, uh, with, within, I think, a few 500 to 1,000 people during the, uh, at the end of March. You know, it right. might have changed, but there's this optimism there. Um, <clears throat> so if if um, uh, so, we we did we did something similar to that um, uh, also to some extent, and and um, one thing that uh, people need to take into account um, is actually. Um, a little bit of the cultural nuances mm -hmm. uh, of the respective countries. Yeah. Um, so if you take Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand, yeah. um, categorically, you would say Malaysia has a bit more of uh, an affluent uh, 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 population. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sorry, not, not really to Singapore per se, but um, Thailand and Indonesia. Right? Yeah. Um, and and when we did uh, a, a similar study, so that reaction, even what we showed on McKinsey front, um, yeah. it's a reflection of more of um, people's hope uh, because survivability is important. Yeah. 
right? Um, and, and because the larger population needs to survive, they don't think much about the context of uh, or the dangers of COVID. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Because it's just about survivability. It's either I die by the pandemic or I die from hunger. Which is, well, which is the lesser of two evils. <laughs> exactly. Right. So, 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 and for them, uh, when we were looking at the data at our end, um, uh, it is actually trying to survive more on this. And I'll take the risk with the health side. Hmm. Um, and, and and that's our conclusion in terms of why you see countries like Indonesia and Thailand perhaps um, uh, has a slightly better sense of optimism as opposed to Malaysia. I see. Um, and and we did um, uh, a breakdown in our study in terms of asking them uh, what are the things that they plan to buy within the next three months. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we asked them also pretty much in terms of, in light of COVID, um, uh, are there any changes to this plans or not? Um, and, and you would see in Malaysia that um, it has a larger percentage of um, people changing their plans from wanting to do it to cancelling it. Um, versus proceeding with it compared to Indonesia and Thailand. Wow. What's common across the board is because we broke it down. Yeah. Um, so McKinsey takes from a macroeconomic lens. We yes. broke it down uh, into what they could possibly do um, as indicators. So we look at whether the propensity for them to buy digital devices. Mm -hmm. We look at them uh, of uh, potentially buying furnitures or large home appliances, buying vehicles, <laughs> buying or renovating a house. Uh, traveling, attending social events, um, uh, even you know losing a marriage uh, as an indicator also. I see. Um, and when we looked at all these things, right? Um, uh, I mean, naturally, the consistency with regards to the social events it cuts across the board. <coughs> but on the other aspect and things, um, it differs. Um, and uh, it is it is interesting to see that. From a confidence level perspective, Malaysia fares the worst compared to the two countries. Hmm. Strange. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So so what you showed just now didn't have Malaysia, right? You had uh yeah, McKinsey, yes. had, McKinsey had um Indonesia, if I'm not mistaken. They had like uh Japan, China, India, and, right. and you know it's <laughs> yeah. So what we did was we did with Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia. Um well, we have presence in Singapore. We didn't do that for, for, for Singapore per se. But um, yeah, so that, that's what we saw essentially. And, and we thought it was interesting. And what we're doing right now is trying to see, okay, um, uh, is there going to be a change uh, within that front? Um, yeah. And what I highlighted to you was uh, something that was uh, captured in uh, April. That's the behavior during the COVID period itself. Um, and, and coincidentally, uh, <laughs> Uh, we were able to compare with um, uh, a study that was done in January uh, mm -hmm. because we, we started a, a, a study in January to actually create a baseline for the year. Uh, not at that time, naturally, you know, we didn't have COVID in the visibility. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when COVID came about, we said, hey, uh, we could use that as a pre-COVID baseline. And then the, the continuous study that we're doing um, on tracking on a week-by-week -week basis is uh, what we could use it as a comparison. I see. Uh, I see. To be able to look at behaviors pre and, and uh, uh, during COVID. Lah. I wouldn't categorize it as post-COVID yet. Um, <laughs> um, but but the, the, the interesting bit when we we're talking to people about data and, and, and so forth, right? Everyone is... Um, uh, I absorbed with this, uh, what's the new normal, Ashran? Um, uh, can you tell us today what's the new normal, uh, are essentially, right? Um, and, 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 you know, my response to them is, you've got your general uh, observational gut feel, new normal that 
any you know person in the community could possibly um, uh, foresee, so to speak, right? Um, I mean, when we talk about online behaviors and stuff, um, from a very macro lens, it's 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 a no-brainer, right? You don't need to do a study to tell that a lot of people are more going online. Yep, true, correct. Um, <laughs> uh, but. But when, when you want to use data, it's, it's, it's to be able to look slightly more at the granular level mm -hmm. um, so that you can uh, take that as an advantage for the business itself. Correct. Uh, understanding that everyone's going online um, and they're doing this uh, is one aspect. But uh, what people have got to also appreciate is that um, you can only anticipate the possibilities of the new normal, but you cannot say yet that this is the new normal. True. Um, because, um, I mean, we talk about consumer behaviors, right? We're influenced by things that happens around us. Correct. Um, so when you are actually capturing data during MCO, that's a different set of behavior. Mm -hmm. When you're capturing data post MCO or CMCO right now that we're in Malaysia, for instance, yeah. that's a different set of data that's coming about. So you can't say that it's transitioning. Uh, I mean, there's a possibility for that, but you really got to look deeper. You got to look at the behavior during uh, MCO. You got to look at behavior during CMCO and then um, extend that a little bit to see whether what is the correlation that is causing these changes. Mm -hmm. right. So even and after the MCO on the 9th, it's going to be a, a different set of uh, data as well. Uh, correct, correct. Um, and, and like, you know, uh, um, what the McKinsey study was, was highlighting, and um, we had actually also even asked the question that uh, when government opens up, yeah, right, what is your time frame that you give yourself to do certain things? Mm -hmm. Is it one month? Is it three months? Is it six months? Um, and, 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 and the results, um, uh, you know, we call it activity readiness. Uh. All right. Um, <laughs> so we asked them about, um, uh, are you willing to take uh, transport services, you know, when government opens this up? Um, uh, you know, and, and we've got about 28% um, uh, of the population in Malaysia that says, I'll wait for one month before I do that. What are they waiting for one month for? <laughs> you know, um, you know <laughs> some sense of stability. I don't want to be... Um, uh, and, and if you notice um, Malaysia right now, um, uh, when a trigger happens, things are not, or processes are not entirely sorted out yet. Yes. Right? So, so we, 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 we think people's reaction to that is people's expectation in terms of how government is handling when things are open up, how people are handling this. So people are giving that buffer. Yes, government says it's open, but I'll give buffer for things to stabilize, for processes to get into place uh, before I take action uh, uh, through. But um, what was interesting from the data that we have is, is that um, you know, if you take an aggregated um, uh, uh, approach, very few, uh, is there, you know, if I'm looking at the screen right now, um, less than 15, 10 to 15% says that they will jump into things immediately. Oh, that's quite a small number. <laughs> yeah. um, and if I were to take... Uh, example like schools, right? Sorry? Yeah, for example like schools. If let's yeah. say government says, all right, let's open up on the 9th of June, all schools. Right. right. Then it, it, the responsibility goes back to the parents of, of all children and all. Are they yeah. going to go send them back to school? Some of them, like even based on your data, most of them will not for a duration period of time, right? Because I of... Tell you right now, dude, we had that question. <laughs> right? More than 50%. Wow. Right. Uh, will take um, three months and above mm -hmm. um, to actually uh, even send their kids to school back or to childcare. 
So this kind of data is very important for especially schools. If they have this data, they can do the necessary actions, uh, policies or whatever to, to make it easier for parents to come back, right? If, right. Rather than de depending on, okay, government says open and they open and no one comes into school. Right. In fact, right. it could be still doing online for the next period of time. There's an example, of course. Right, right, right. And, and I think to some extent, um, uh, some schools uh, or colleges even are um, already taking that stance, right? Mm. And that's coming from a gut feel perspective. Um, and, and, and when we talk about data and what people need to appreciate when, when the data conversation comes up, right? Um, it is nothing, it's always nothing definitive per se. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is really uh, with data, uh, you are able to maximize the possibilities of uh, getting your decision to be right and to minimize the possibilities of errors. Yes. Right? Correct. <laughs> Fundamentals of risk management if you take in that context, right? <laughs> yeah. True, true, true. Now, Ashran, uh, um, we see a lot of... Uh, I mean, we, let's talk to you about your CPI, all right? Uh, sure. CPI itself, is, uh, I think it's, it's quite an interesting app uh, we also see an onslaught of apps from the government. <laughs> you have your MyTrace, you have your MySejatra, uh, <clears throat> and and whatnot. So, and the only thing I, I see, uh, of course, your side, you have a dashboard is for the enterprise version where the employees employers get to monitor the the stuff right. who was actually on the platform. Now, um, are we going to continue seeing an onslaught of apps like this and dashboards? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and of course, like we have government, the government has already thought about, okay, we have a contact tracing app. We have a, uh, uh, an app that actually tried to manage uh, infection risk, and then whatever not, which is uh, your app is also an independent app. Now, um, do you see collaborations happening between companies like yours and the government? Um, let me address the first part of the question first before yes. we go and look into the collaboration aspect and things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like I mentioned just now, uh, yes, I do see uh, an onslaught uh, of apps coming into uh, uh, the market, essentially. As it is, as we speak, there's already quite a bit of those. Yeah. Um, so, and if you were to block it from a government block and a private sector block, government blocks is very clear, right? You've got the Gara app, you've got the MySejatra, and you've got the MyTrace uh, yeah. uh, at the moment. Um, Gura is supposed to be more for movement and accessibility for movement. Mm -hmm. uh, my space is for contact tracing primarily. And then um, my Jatra, uh, it's a little bit more health uh, informational stuff that's actually being channeled out to yes. um, uh, uh, people, right? Yes. Um, now, uh, these are good tools for government to manage, mm -hmm. right? But when it comes to for businesses to manage, um, those uh, uh, data points, so to speak, are not accessible to businesses. So then you see the onslaught of private sectors coming onto stream, uh, also providing some level of contact tracing capability and so forth. But um, what you see in the market um, is uh, pretty much, <clears throat> if we talk from an app lens, yeah. Um, uh, everyone is also in this uh, QR code bandwagon, if you ask me. <laughs> uh, everything is suddenly about QR codes. Yeah. Uh, um, but if you cut all the noise, right, uh, Rudy? Yeah. Uh, essentially, all the apps out there are doing registry, and they're just different forms of registry. Mm -hmm. Right? If you're going to a mall, uh, it's a registry. If you're going to an office, people are doing registry. Yeah. Um, and registry, as we spoke earlier on, um, is good uh, when something bad happens. <laughs> right? Yes. And we talked but, before, it's reactive, yeah. All right. Right, right. Uh, again, I'm not saying that you should not have registry. I think you should have. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, as a business owner, uh, and if you talk about risk management earlier on, um, uh, uh, registry doesn't handle risk, right? Yep. Registry handles just the crisis that has happened. <laughs> Correct. 
um, um, uh, and, and, and our proposition uh, uh, into the market. And, and we're taking a stance that it's not just about us pushing the app ourselves, right? Uh, because to do what we're doing requires heavy investments. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because uh, there's a lot of um, formulations in coming up with that particular scoring itself. Yeah. Um, we, we take into account people's movements, right? And, and, and to just put into context in terms of why it was natural for us to get into this path, mm -hmm. um, the score that we're putting across, right? And if I may just uh, uh, tweak a little bit how you framed yes. uh, CPI earlier on, yeah. <clears throat> we're telling people that CPI score is not about your health. Mm -hmm. CPI score is actually a score that tells you your risk exposure. It yes. tells you whether have you been to places that is deemed high risk or not. Mm -hmm. Are you, you know, right now government is saying that you should, you know, from your house, go straight to the office. If you need to get to your office and maybe make any one or two stops uh, if for you to buy stuff that you need. Otherwise, don't go and kind of uh, mingle around too much because you right. need to still maintain this environment uh, uh, through. Yeah. Um, so what we try to capture is actually exactly that the algorithm that the team has designed takes into account tell me your home tell me where's your office mm. our calculate score if you just maintain these two locations your scores get affected a little bit the minute you start going somewhere else if you spend too long in that particular location if the location is deemed as um, you know if you go to uh, pasa borong then we will say that that's slightly higher risk Wow. And, and, and so forth, right? So if I put back to the context of our conversation, Rudy, all we're trying to do is trying to provide you with a simple way through data of mm -hmm. your behavior. Yeah. Right? And telling you without you needing to do an analysis on your own that by this calculation, dude, uh, you're in the yellow band, you know, it's not too bad, uh, but just be careful, right? Because the, the, the challenge with government uh, uh, is essentially, you know, our, our awesome DG of health. Yes. And, and, and you can hear him literally pleading when you read press conferences. Yes. <laughs> uh, or when you see the, 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 the press releases that, that goes out uh, and the stories that's covered, right? He's like literally telling people, please, guys, you know, yeah. take care of this. And, and, and we had the conversation earlier on also uh, before the show that... Um, you know, in spite of the government telling you, don't cross borders to go back, you've got <laughs> massive jam on the highway. Yeah, you see yeah. pictures of cars still lining up to go by the kampong. <laughs> right. So let me put this, this perspective to hand. All we're trying to do here with regards to this CPI score, right, is to remind individuals because we feel that we understand consumer behaviors, people's behavior. People's behavior needs to be reminded. We are all human beings. Yes. Um, and even for me, right, um, the tendency for me to sometimes go to places that I may not supposed to be not supposed to go may be there because you take for granted. The minute you feel slightly safe, you will start going beyond your, 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 your threshold. <laughs> right? But, um, you know, we all want to meet our family members. And one of the things that triggered uh, in designing this was my partner... Uh, dad um, uh, uh, was flagged as um, uh, uh, possibly exposed to COVID, right? And we had this conversation, hey, shit, man, uh, if, if um, uh, uh, the, the, the whole MCO thing, and you want to meet your parents, and they yeah. are deemed high risk because they're elderly people, do we go or not? Because we go out, we go to work, and we do all these things, right? So it's empowering even the individuals if people take it seriously enough. Yes. Um, now, if I see my, my score, because for some reason I was, you know, really doing a lot of traveling and without me realizing, going to places that I may not, uh, I should not have gone to, or not should not have gone to, like that. it's just high risk, but I have to be there. Yeah. Then if I see my score is slightly lower for the day, then I should make that responsible decision to not visit my parents yet. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Because people ask me also, Ashran, who is going to enforce this app? Mm -hmm. Right? 
is government going to enforce? I said, you know what? Even if government enforce, uh, nobody's going to listen. Look at what's happening right now in the market. Yeah. <laughs> right? I put it back onto the owners of business owners, essentially, to actually be the enforcers. Right? True. Because they've got skin in the game. I want to prevent from my office, my staff, I want to protect my staff uh, uh, to ensure that they are safe. Um, so, and that's the, the narrative and messaging that needs to go out. And if we get, bro, every single business is doing this, right? It's, you take it from this lens, it's democratization of managing people. Yeah. Right? And True. not just, you know, our DG uh, 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 through the TV channels and media channels trying to tell people. Uh, because we are all human beings, right? If it's too remote, um, uh, then then people, you know, it doesn't sink in. Your boss tells you, because he's paying your paycheck, you probably have to listen, <laughs> right? So so that's what we're trying to design here. Um, uh, it's 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 far more complicated if you ask me, just from just looking at purely at an app. We had to look at what is the dynamics at play. What yes. influences a person's behavior? How do we make sure that this behavior can be sustained? Yeah. So, so we're even toying around a tagline as, 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 as we release this next month um, for businesses to be open and stay open. <laughs> because you can be open, right? And if you just do your registry check-ins, maybe you're not going to be staying open. True. Right? Um, so, so, so that's 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 the the news. Sorry, it's a bit long-winded, but that that question requires that. Yeah. That, but that. Now, Ashran, uh, now we have some questions on uh, on uh, from the audiences. Maybe just sure. take one or two, right? Um, let's look at this. This is from Saiful. Uh, interesting discussion. A couple of questions. What uh -huh. is good? What is a good starting point to start gathering data? What tools should a business use to gather, gather data which is relevant to them? Wow. <laughs> um, uh, it's a really uh, stifle, good question, but it is also a, quite a broad question, right? Um, uh, I mentioned just now it's about intent. Uh, and if you can somehow post this back a little bit in terms of what business context, then I can try and answer that a little bit more accurately. Mm -hmm. um, because if you are a retail business, uh, uh, a way to answer this is slightly different. Uh, if you are an uh, online business, also slightly different. Um, uh, but if I were to just uh, answer this from a more consumer-facing business, um, uh, I would start with uh, having a CRM in play, right? <laughs> what people take for granted with regards to CRM um, uh, it is just me gathering database and managing that database sometimes, mm. <laughs> right? Um, but if you're serious about data, then CRM is always a good starting point uh, for you to be able to understand your customers a lot better. Um, so so that, that would be my uh, response uh, uh, to this question, essentially. Um, uh, Again, um, you know, if you post uh, a little bit more specific in terms of the sector that you're talking about, then I can try and respond uh, uh, a little bit more. But otherwise, that's my best response at the moment. Okay, good. There is another question here um, yeah. regarding to relating to CPI from Kumanan. CPI sounds interesting. How assessing risk levels can impact policy making? For instance, if low cost ah. CPR pose high. <laughs> Health risks would that push for better housing policies? <laughs> um, so, so interesting um, uh, <laughs> point to note uh, uh, there, Kumanan. Um, uh, number one, short answer is yes. Right. Um, right now, uh, the potential evolution of uh, CPI uh, can actually go in terms of what intent that you want to do. Right, um, and 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 if we're talking about you know uh, PPR and all these things, 
uh, it's really a matter of is there any additional data points that relates to what is relevant to that particular policy per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. You could take things on a surface level and you can also go deeper uh, uh, with regards to this. Um, from a longer term perspective, because a lot of companies also ask me this, right? Ashran, uh, you talk CPI right now with regards to the MCO and COVID-19. So what happens post this? Lah, right? I said, number one, um, uh, uh, Kumanan's question, if you ask me, uh, reflects that essentially, right? <laughs> um, uh, and there are many ways to go, to go, to go, to go about it. Um, uh, but uh, I think uh, you're quite spot on with regards to looking uh, in terms of policy making, um, because uh, we are also, um, you know, one of our aspirational goals is is to be able to look at supporting governments um, in in trying to be more data driven with regards to policy making, um, and and to be able to view data from different types of uh, a perspective. Um, and not just uh, coming from a macro top-down lens, but coming from a bottom-up lens uh, on the realities on the ground, essentially. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's one more question um, which I wanted sure. to ask you. This one, um, from your perspective, and I know I think we we, we talked a lot about this. Uh, but <laughs> in your opinion, which industry would actually recover the earliest, and which one would be the last to get back on track? Your your pick. <laughs> Um, if, if you ask me, I think, um, uh, the childcare sector, mm -hmm. um, is, is going to be, um, a greatly hit because I know they are asking, uh, Ministry of Health to allow them to open, right? Um, but, uh, Ministry of Health concern is whether they are able to, have the right SOPs or not. Yeah. Uh, and when I talk about childcare services, these are the, the slightly lower age group, uh, preschooling type uh, age group, yes. right? Um, so, so I think they're going to be the worst impacted. And, and for them to, to the need for them to look at new ways of doing things that is really out of what they're doing right now. Um, simply because, uh, as we spoke earlier on throughout this, this particular show also already, Adult punya behavior pun susah. Nah, you want to take care, right? What more uh, when you talk about kids? You think what you're gonna do social distancing at the Tasca? Um, it's gonna be a say, challenge. Hey, you just stay here, right? They, don't they will not understand. They will not understand. Even if you go back to the office, you will have people that is not going to be doing social distancing, and that's adults. Yeah. Um, so, so hence, I think, I think that that sector um, um, would, would naturally be uh, uh, the worst impacted with regards. But to you that. know, Ashran, it's going to be a, uh, it's going to be a cascading waterfall effect. You see, if um, daycares are not allowed to be open, right? Yeah. The parents they need to go to work, and they can't put their kids at daycare. So their work productiveness will be uh, affected. Right, so right. I guess this one is, I guess, needs to be thought about a little bit deeper before any decision is made. But you are right. I mean, the daycare services uh, industry is going to be badly hit because it's not easy. It's not, it's not like a one-day thing that you can say, okay, let's open tomorrow. Let's yeah. open tomorrow. It's not, it's not something easy. And, and I cannot at the moment fathom any form of SOP that would give a confidence level <clears throat> to a parent, right? Um, uh, uh, to be able to, to send their kids there. Um, but the pressure point happens when the parent needs to also earn income and there's no one else taking care of the, uh, for the kids. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I, you do see um, a more innovative platforms right now trying to address that a little bit in providing uh, online nanny services and stuff mm -hmm. um, and, and, and giving that, that level of security per se. Yeah. Um, so that means uh, a person goes to the house to kind of take care of the kids and, 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 and so forth. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the price points and affordability is a different issue that needs to be addressed. Um, so again, um, you know, uh, government uh, should take into, you know, 
coming from magic before, bro. Yes. Um, uh, I do believe that government should be really proactive in running a government open innovation exercise, mm. using that as a platform, right? To allow startups to actually help support the government yeah. uh, in, in solving this, this, this issues any, um, and, and then coming up with some level of incentive scheme that kind of allows a bunch of startups that are solving a similar problem because not one startup can actually solve that particular problem itself. Yes, yes. Um, uh, so I, that's what I think uh, a government uh, should be doing. Um, uh, it needs to, again, like I said, uh, be accessible uh, uh, to people. Um, uh, and when I talk about a government open innovation platform, right, I understand government needs to ensure um, whatever that is been delivered uh, has a certain level of uh, service delivery quality. Yes. Um, and, and if you take from a psyche perspective, it is like government operating uh, an app store or a Google Play store. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, app stores and Google Play stores doesn't just allow you to simply put on their store. Mm. Right. They've got to go to a certain vetting process uh, uh, itself. Yeah. But I think um, the government needs to, to actually, um, I know they're doing this through conversations. I know Ministry of Finance, uh, historically and right now, is having sessions uh, with industry players and, 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 and so forth, right? But it's in a closed group. The out-of-the-box solution sometimes happens outside that closed group. Mm. Yeah? Um, and, and with all due respect to large companies, um, while large companies can definitely play a, a huge role in creating that impact, but it may not necessarily be out of the box. So, so um, partly going back to your earlier question on government just now, right? So it's not about just the apps that we're doing about over here. It's about the totality of things. Yeah. Uh, and, and if government doesn't create that 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 platforms uh, uh, per se right you will have really awesome solutions out there that mm -hmm. will not get the light of day um, to help support government's efforts no it's, it's a it's really interesting to 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 have you think that okay having startups to come in and, and solve this problem uh, that's that's really interesting I mean I know you come from that uh, magic background and it's always it's a lens that you it will never go away yeah, you know, Asran, we had a very great discussion. Um, I think we touched a lot on on a lot of areas. Um, before we close up the session, I would like to thank you again for being part of the discussion. I really uh, no, no. Happy, 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 happy to be here. Um. You know, it's it's always good to have like uh, a chat within the discussion. It, it's really great. So, um, you know, I hope that it's also uh, for business professionals to pick up a thing or two uh, that are tuning in. Uh, and hope that this would have been something that can add value to your organization. Thank you again, Ashran. In the future, we hope we can do a follow-up meet. Uh, maybe. I'm um, sure, at, sure, sure, sure. And if I may, at, you know, um, to um, uh, Kumanan and, and, and Saiful uh, just now, if uh, um, you want to kind of slightly dig uh, deeper, um, uh, drop me an email uh, at ashran at datel.asia. Yes. Um, more than happy uh, to see um, uh, different perspectives uh, on, on, on how the, how uh, I can address some of the things that you were asking us now. Yeah. Thanks again, Ashran. Um, maybe after the CMCO is lifted, probably new data will be available and then probably we'll do a follow-up meet later on. Uh, I would like to urge yeah. the audiences out there to uh, subscribe to our channel on YouTube and Facebook uh, as we will have uh, regular webinars like this fortnightly. This session will be put up on our channels for people to view. We have replays, so please do share with your colleagues. As a business, uh, Cisco Biosecurity does business continuity planning, training, and also sanitization. Now, over the past few weeks, we have been busy disinfecting many commercial workspaces most of them with high microbial counts. No kidding. So if you have a similar need, please do contact us. We have experts that can help you and your business. You can visit us at our website at ciscobiosecurity.com for more details. 
Lastly, thank you to our audiences uh, for participating. Uh, we hope the session has been enlightening. Stay tuned to more in the near future. I am Rudy Malik from Cisco Biosecurity. Thank you, Ashran. Uh, we are signing off. Stay safe during the CMCO. Practice social distancing. Uh, wash your hands regularly. And to all Muslims, Selamat Hari Raya. Selamat Hari Raya, Ashran. Have Hi, a great day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.